So in 1905, a very tall, one-eyed man named Big Bill Haywood walked onto a stage in Chicago in front of a crowd of a uh, hundred communists, anarchists, and trade union organizers. And he said uh, that the Continental Congress of the working class had officially commenced. And in that Continental Congress, they were going to found or create uh, one big union. Now this organization would not be called one big union for very long. It was actually known by, uh, well, much more well known by a different name, the Industrial Workers of the World, or IWW. And well, the IWW never really got more than uh, 150, 200,000 members, and today is actually quite small in comparison to other uh, unions in existence. This 1905 declaration was a watershed moment for the history of industrial unionism. Now in this class, we've talked a little bit about all, uh, a little bit already about craft unionism and community unionism, these two approaches, uh, but we've kind of danced around this, this third form of unionism. And that's what this lecture is primarily going to focus on today, and that is industrial unionism. Before we get started though, of course, I have some extra reading recommendations. Uh, today's lecture is actually going to be kind of divided into four, uh, we're gonna talk about four different strikes with a little bit of nuance here. And these two books uh, cover two of those strikes in pretty good detail. The first one is called uh, Killing for Coal, America's Deadliest Labor War, and it's about the Colorado Coalfield War, which went from 1913 to 1914 and uh, ended shortly after the 1914 Ludlow Massacre in April. And the other book is Bruce Watson's Bread and Roses, uh, and that is about the Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts, the IWW um, one. We'll also be talking about the Pullman strike, and we will be talking about the anthracite coal strike today. But right, let's, uh, let's back up really quick before we jump into industrial unionism and the one big union in the IWW. Recall that these autonomous community unions uh, that were first organized under the Knights of Labor with the 1877 uh, Great Upheaval, the Great Railroad Strike, um, they could adopt some pretty racist and sexist policies of exclusion. Um, this is because a lot of these unions were based on uh, local geography. And in a given local geography, you have like, of course, a lot of different, a lot of different opinions, a lot of different interests and viewpoints. And uh, when you organize a group of workers based on their geography, the people with the most power in a community tend to have the greatest voice. Later craft unions um, organized under the a not only the AFL, but independent brotherhoods and other competing federations, uh, instead of organizing along geographic lines, would organize workers along lines of like craft skill, right? If you had a trade, if you knew how to do a very complex process that required a lot of training, craft unions would organize you uh, in order to kind of protect that knowledge to make sure there is a, a monopoly on that knowledge so that the union could set wages and rates and in compensation. Now the community unions uh, excluded people along racial lines and lines of sex. Uh, craft unions did this too, um, but they also uh, discriminated along the lines of technical skill, right? If you were quote unquote unskilled, uh, craft unions, you weren't of very much use to them. You didn't have any specific knowledge um, and they didn't really see you as a worker who was worth organizing. This contributed to something called the labor aristocracy, right? Where skilled workers had a more privileged uh, position in society because of that skill. And uh, that difference between skilled and quote unquote unskilled labor was essentially created uh, out of this exclusion of the unskilled. And of course, uh, who were the unskilled workers and who were the workers that had uh, pathways to get a skilled trade? This was also often along lines of race and sex. 
Now this entrenched labor aristocracy meant that the labor movement, which was mostly comprised of uh, craft and some remaining community unions, uh, could be pretty unresponsive to the demands of many American workers. Now it's important to note that earlier on in the process of industrialization, we still have all of this, uh, all of this Western land, we still have a, a fairly agrarian society. Right, this concept of free labor, which is different from wage labor, where a worker can be, you know, self-sufficient on these small family farms. This process is starting to die out. And as industrialization begins to speed up, more and more people are going to the cities. And because industrialization is taking place with this process of de-skilling, right, this process of taking a complex trade and breaking it down to a lot of simple jobs, many of these workers coming to the cities, uh, either from the countryside or from overseas as, immigrate, as immigrants, um, don't have the, the skills uh, to get a, a craft and um, a more respectable standard of living and form of employment compensation. So increasingly, women workers, African-American workers, uh, immigrant workers, others in marginalized communities in the ranks of the unskilled, as time goes on, begin to call for their own union that isn't divided along lines of skilled and unskilled, uh, or isn't divided along lines of geography, but in, is instead one big union that can represent all workers, regardless of these different divisions within the working class. Now, of course, you'll notice that I'm like putting unskilled in quotes. It's important to remember that just because you don't have a skilled trade or a craft doesn't mean you're an unskilled worker. Um, referring to workers as unskilled is more or less a, a terminology that was invented by the employment class and uh, the labor aristocracy to justify lower wages for workers who didn't have a monopoly on a specific skill. Uh, but anyone who has worked more than a month at a McDonald's will tell you there is certain amounts of skill that you have to learn in order to do that job well. Uh, or at least do that job without pulling your hair out, right? So unskilled here isn't really uh, what it means when we first look at it, but it is a marker that's applied to workers who are largely going without craft representation. So you have calls for this one big union, right? What is it gonna look like? What is one big union? Well, it depends on who you ask. Uh, different people um, would characterize uh, the one big union, this kind of aspirational organization that workers were beginning to call for, they would describe it in different ways, right? Some um, claimed that one big union would just be a very inclusive labor federation like the AFFL, but it wouldn't discriminate along the lines of, of race or sex or age or skill, right? Positioning in the labor aristocracy. Others, uh, like the IWW and Big Bill Haywood in Chicago, um, wanted something more. They, instead of just one big labor federation, uh, they imagined a system much more expansive, a system of direct democratic representation that would not only command the government, but also the economy, something akin to like a classless society that Marx envisioned. But anyone who advocated for, not everyone who advocated for one big union was suddenly a Marxist, right? There were all of these different kinds of, of ideas about how you would create one big union. And one big union, uh, it never really comes to fruition. I don't wanna spoil the story. Uh, the closest thing we probably have today is the AFL-CIO, at least in the United States. But even that is more or less limited to the lines of America's national boundaries. But something that does come out of this turn in the labor movement is the creation of um, the first industrial unions. And so we should take a look at these definitions, right? Because we're all about vocabulary. So one big union is kind of this aspirational organization that would, you know, depending on who you asked, uh, in different categories of power, right, would represent the international working class holistically. Um, it's important to specify that the the working class would be international. There wouldn't be these kinds of uh, divisions along lines of citizenship or nationality. Industrial unionism, which more or less comes around uh, at the same time as these calls for 
one big union are being made, is a little less specific. Industrial unionism recognizes that craft unionism hasn't really done what a lot of workers need it to do. You have these divisions along identity, you have these divisions based on skill and these like minor class um, barriers that have kind of been put up by this labor aristocracy that, well, protecting some workers don't protect all. So industrial unionism is uh, this approach that comes along where labor organizers want to combine all workers in the same industry into one union. And that's regardless of their skill or trade, right? And this, in theory, would provide workers with much more power uh, and leverage when they're bargaining with employers in that industry, right? So if we think about an example of, uh, let's say, textile workers, right? There's a lot of different tasks in the textile industry where you take cotton or wool and uh, you eventually get a piece of clothing that is ready to be sold uh, in a market, right? There's a lot of different stages in that, in that process of creating that, 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 um, that product. So under craft unionism, uh, people who pick the cotton would not have a union because that's not viewed as a skill, right? But someone who uh, is running machinery that threshes the cotton and makes it pliable and can actually like put it into a bolt of fabric, they might have a union, right? It depends on how you define skill and whether or not you're in an area where that kind of labor is seen as respectable. In a lot of the earliest mills, you have uh, unions try to represent mill workers, if you recall Eric Loomis's uh, mill strikes chapter. But this wasn't uh, the case for everyone, right? Industrial work, um, mill work was not always seen as a skilled type of work. And so it was entirely possible to be employed in that with that craft and not have a craft union. And then further along down the line, as you have kind of these bolts of fabric, you have individuals like going through and sewing and, and making ready-made clothing. They also might have a union, but again, uh, it depends on how you define craft. So in the textile industry, depending on how you organize workers, you could have many different craft unions or no craft unions at all. And those act, craft unions might actually disagree with each other. Now, if you compare that to one giant union for all workers in the textile industry, uh, it can be pretty easy to see how uh, by being more inclusive and having a larger organization, there's a lot less confusion around bargaining and organizing work. So we're going to talk about four main unions as we go through uh, these four strikes today. The United Mine Workers of America was the uh, founded in 1890. You don't need to know that for an exam or anything, but it was kind of one of these earlier uh, industrial unions. The American Railway Union founded in 1893. The Western Federation of Miners founded that same year, and then finally the Industrial Workers of the World founded in 1905 when Bill, uh, Bill Haywood gives that speech, uh, starting the Continental Congress of the Working Class. Now, sometimes in labor history, we have repeats of things. Right? We have, in 1877, we have this great upheaval, and you have this emergence of community unionism and the Knights of Labor. Ultimately, it is suppressed. Um, by the government. Reconstruction is ended as a part of this and uh, organized labor is where the labor movement is starts to explode is more or less reined in by this inner this na nationwide policing and uh, National Guard apparatus. Now a couple years later um, you have a similar strike in the railroad industry. Now this time it's not actually about uh, the strike doesn't revolve around workers who are actively moving trains, like in, uh, in the Great Railroad Strike in Baltimore and Ohio, but it actually is focused around workers who are assembling train cars for a company called uh, the Pullman Car Company. Now, Pullman was one of a lot of different railroad companies that assembled cargo and passenger cars, which would then be transported on different lines like Baltimore and Ohio, where Union Pacific is a pretty famous one, right? Pullman specifically was pretty famous for designing these very, um, these very luxurious passenger cars 
uh, sleeper cars specifically. So if you're going from one end of the country to another, you know, you'd pay a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra money and you'd have this entire room with these beds set aside for you, these sleeper cars. Now Pullman made a lot of uh, money making these sleeper cars, right? This is very lucrative. Um, not only uh, did you have a constant source of revenue coming in for passengers on these sleeper cars, we could charge a lot of money, but you also had uh, the ability of these sleeper cars to um, haul freight if they weren't used, in, in use, right? If uh, someone didn't have uh, a room in a sleeper car checked out, it was entirely possible that you could uh, you know, put the mail in there, packaging, or, you know, you could use these cars also for transportation of some goods. So once Pullman made these cars, they had a pretty consistent and reliable source of income. There's a better picture of, of these sleeper cars here. You can see on the side, this one is based out of the city of New York. If you think about uh, constructing train cars, uh, it's it was very akin to uh, to the automotive industry before we had the automotive industry, right? It was kind of the, the center of national transportation. And in a country as large as the United States, the transportation industry is always going to be very massive, right? So before cars, trains were kind of uh, the key industry in, in American industrialization. Now, despite how lucrative the Pullman company was, they did not pay a lot out to their workers. Specifically, workers employed uh, at Pullman um, often were kind of uh, double gouged in terms of labor exploitation, right? So Pullman didn't pay very well. But in addition to not paying well, if you're going to work for Pullman, you had to work, you had to live in one of their dorms, right? They had workers dorms nearby their, uh, their assembly plants and factories, kind of like their building workshops where they made these sleeper cars. And so if you're going to work for Pullman, you had to live in these dorms. And these dorms, which were basically at the center, um, revolved around, like where the, the factory was kind of the center and these dorms were kind of like uh, orbiting around these, these workplaces. You would also have uh, stores, post offices, schools, you know, general uh, social amenities that were paid for by the company that um, workers would use, right? So if you wanted your child to go to school, you were working for Pullman, you were living in these dorms, Pullman said, that's fine. Um, we'll have a, a public school or we'll have a school that is provided to you. It might not be public, right? Um, we'll also make sure there's a store here. But all of these amenities were run by the company, right? So if you went to, if your child went to uh, get an education, that teacher is going to be inclined to say good things about the company. If you're going to go to the general store, it's entirely possible that you might be paying more for a product than what it's actually worth. Of course, if a company owns an entire town, then that means that uh, free market competitors can't really show up in the town and try to underbid that company established general store. And a lot of companies would actually pay employees in these kinds of living arrangements and company script, right? So we're not actually going to pay you in money. We're going to pay you in Pullman dollars. And you can spend those Pullman dollars at the general store, or you can spend these Pullman dollars on your rent in these Pullman houses. This kind of living arrangement is called a company town. A company town is where nearly all stores, housing, amenities, and other sorts of things are controlled by one company. And that company also serves as that town's main employer. Now, a lot of times when people talk about company towns, they think about these, these disparate places out west. Um, and a lot of that comes from stereotypical views of the mining industry, which we'll be talking about in a little bit here. But if you think about the greater Detroit area, some of our more infamous suburbs uh, or nearby orbiting towns started off as company towns. A good example of that is Dearborn, right? Ford, uh, the River Rouge complex, all of these factories that Ford runs were built outside of the city of Detroit to give the Ford car company, Ford Motor Company, a lot more legal leeway in terms of how it conducted its business. So after the, these Ford assembly plants started to be established, first up in Highland Park, which is not a part of uh, Detroit, mind you, right? But then as they moved further outside of the city to places like Dearborn, Dearborn and Highland Park are examples 
of uh, towns that initially started off as company towns. Hamtramck is another one that kind of orbited around the um, Chrysler. And uh, Flint and Pontiac um, very much revolved around General Motors. So when we look at the metropolitan Detroit area, we also have company towns here. Those are some examples. Now all of these workers who are uh, building these sleeper cars for Pullman are, you know, initially they're not organized. They're not in a labor union. Um, depending on who you were to ask, building a sleeper car may or may not be skilled work. But coinciding with uh, greater calls of workers for more inclusive forms of labor organizing and more powerful unions that brought more workers together, you have um, socialist organizers um, and trade union activists like Eugene Debs um, arrive in towns like Pullman, right? So the Pullman Car Company um, had a town south of Chicago called Pullman where they built these cars. And Eugene V. Debs and these other advocates uh, began to try to organize workers at Pullman under this organization known as the American Railway Union. Now the American Railway Union was going to try and cross lines of individual crafts, right? So you're not just a boiler maker. You're not just a track gauge setter. You're not just um, a textile worker who's making like sheets and bedding and things that are gonna go into these sleeper cars, making upholstery. You're not just a woodworker. If you're working in the railway, if you're working in this railway assembly operation, you can be a part of this union. And the goal is that by getting all the workers together, one big strike can force Pullman to improve workers' conditions. So here's actually a really good example of a, of a political cartoon that demonstrates kind of what's going on in these company towns by Pullman, right? In times of uh, economic contraction, when Pullman isn't making as much money as they would like to, though they are still, you know, usually they're still profitable, but they're maybe not making, uh, making as much profits as they would have liked. Um, Pullman can, at the same time, either or just one at a time, lower wages of workers or higher or like increase their rents. Um, they, can, they can do one or if times are particularly bad, they can do both. That will bring Pullman in a lot more money uh, by, you know, essentially their profit comes from the labor of their workers, right? Pullman here over in the, uh, the top hat, he's kind of turning this press. He isn't actually the one making the cars, but he you know, his uh, profits come from the like sales and uh, the revenue from those cars that the worker makes. And so his uh, profit is more or less tied to extraction of that worker's labor power. And so if he's not making enough money, he can lower wages or he can increase rents to kind of get more money out of that worker. But when you do this in times of economic desperation, that's not very good for your working base, is it? So the American Railway Union brought workers at Pullman to a consensus kind of like they organized, they uh, calculated what sometimes is referred to as this as a mass line where labor organizers will talk to a lot of workers over a course of a long period of time and figure out what everyone's goals are. And then they do what's called a synthesis and they come out with a list of demands to give to a company, right? This is a process in organizing and the American Railway Union does this. They go to Pullman and say, if you don't do these mainly three things, uh, we're going to go on strike. Of course, Pullman is a massive uh, train manufacturing, car manufacturing company, these train cars that they're making. And they're looking at uh, the American Railway Union. It's only been around for a year or so. And they say, no, we're not. We're not doing any of this. We're not gonna recognize the ARU as, uh, as a valid representative for workers. We're not gonna increase wages at all, and we're not going to lower rents. Um, you don't have any say in how we conduct our business. It's our property, it's our, um, we own the means of production. And so, you know, tough, take a walk. So the American Ra Railway Union, in order to uh, get Pullman to accept workers' demands, calls a strike. Now more skilled over the rail workers, they're called over the rail workers because they work over the rails. Um, are not affiliated with the ARU. They're actually uh, part of railroad craft brotherhoods tied to the American Federation of Labor, right? And if we recall from our last lecture, when we talk about the labor aristocracy and we talk about politics of respectability, 
the American Federation of Labor, as it kind of grew into its maturity, did not want to engage in strikes. It didn't want to engage in any kind of direct action or any kind of union militancy that um, more unskilled workers, quote unquote, might want to engage in because uh, the American Federation of Labor largely uh, viewed itself as a middle class organization. It didn't want to be seen as doing anything like haymarket bombings or these uh, these actions which were kind of morally reprehensible to general society. And so the American Federation of Labor and some of these skilled over the rail workers don't participate in the strike. Now, unable to win the support of over the railway workers, or you know, at least form an alliance with the AFL, the American Railway Union calls for a boycott of Poland cars. If you don't know um, what a boycott is, it's basically an organizing tool that's not only, you know, it's not limited to labor unions, it's any kind of uh, grassroots or working class organizing tool where you just get everyone to agree not to do business with, um, with someone who you're opposed to, right? If there's a specific thing that, uh, that a company or a country or, uh, or a store or any sort of organization is doing that's, uh, that's reprehensible, you can say, well, as long as you're doing this, we're not going to do business with you, right? If anyone remembers um, the table uh, grape strike that the United Farm Workers um, fought for in the 1960s and 70s, that's an example of a boycott. Um, the divestment movement around uh, the apartheid era South African government is an example of a boycott, right? Getting everyone to refuse to do business with them in order to kind of get them to change their ways. The ARU calls for a boycott of Pullman cars. And while the American Feder Federation of Labor, right, and Samuel Gomper as these craft unionists are very much kind of tied to these notions of respectability and we don't do anything that could be seen as kind of disrupting commerce, you know, we're, we're for respectable workers. Well, the AFL doesn't want to engage in this boycott. Um, a lot of over-the-rail workers are still sympathetic to the ARU. And so they begin to refuse to move Pullman cars as part of a sympathy strike. Now, a sympathy strike is a kind of striker labor action where workers um, take action or refuse to work, not because they're, um, they're fighting with their employer, but they're offering support for another group of workers who are also on strike. And that's usually, though not always, in the same or a related industry. So the ARU says, we're going on strike. The AFL says, well, we're not going to. Enough of over the rail workers in the AFL say, well, we're actually sympathetic to the ARU, so we're on strike also. Now, this ends up disrupting interstate commerce, right? Once you have over the rail workers refusing to pull Pullman cars, it's not just a production stoppage in Pullman, south of Chicago, and that these other these other manufacturers that are building train cars, it's also, um, you have uh, interstate commerce, you have the interstate transportation, the national transportation network grinding to a halt, right? Because workers aren't moving trains anymore. And this is very uh, similar to what ends up happening in 1877, right? Baltimore and Ohio refuses to pay their workers. So everywhere workers say, well, we're not moving your trains. Well, it's not just Baltimore and Ohio that's shutting down. If Baltimore and Ohio is responsible for moving things, then all of the material they're moving also shuts down and all of those related industries start to shut down. And the federal government looks at what's going on in the Pullman strike and they view something very similar uh, potentially starting to happen. If you remember, uh, 1877 gave a, gave a lot of American workers a lot of anxieties. And even up until the Pullman strike in 1894, you're still having a lot of these smaller towns that witness these general strikes and riots and uprisings. They're still working on their armories that they had said, all right, well, because of this, we're going to build these armories in the middle of town. So this is in very recent memory and the government doesn't want this to happen again. So the federal government meets with Pullman and they say, well, Pullman, if you start carrying the federal mail on your cars, then we can file an injunction against the, the railway union because they are blocking uh, the U.S. Postal Service. That's just, you know, a felony. So Pullman assumes contracts to carry U.S. mail, and the federal government files an injunction against the American Railway Union. 
This ultimately leads the Pullman strike to fail, right? Federal troops are sent in and the majority peaceful strikes end up turning violent and uh, upwards of 30 workers are killed with many more injured in, in the ensuing crackdown. By breaking the injunction, the fledgling American Railway Union loses all of its funds, all of its stockpiled monies, and a lot of prominent strike leaders like Eugene V. Debs uh, end up in prison. So it's not a happy story, right? The Pullman strike fails because of an injunction, because Pullman assumes these contracts. There's some backdoor dealings. If you look at the state of American politics today, you know, everything old is new again. But Pullman also teaches us that disunity in the labor movement can doom workers' actions, even if they're supported by a majority of the population, right? The American Railway Union was able to unionize workers at Pullman, and they were so successful in doing so that even workers affiliated with the AFL, who were told not to strike, still wanted to sympathy strike. That labor movement disunity um, might have, you know, we don't want to get too too deep into counterfactuals, right? Counterfactual is a fancy way for the historians used to say alternative histories, right? We don't want to go down rabbit holes of what could have been, though it is worth saying it's entirely possible that had the AFL um, collaborated and worked with the ARU, that Pullman may have been a success. And how might that have changed uh, the state of working conditions in the United States at the time, right? So the American Railway Union doesn't really last for more than a year, two years or so, and it is ultimately defeated. But it's one of these important organizations to keep in mind because it's one of these earliest attempts at industrial unionizing, right? Not just going to individual shops and getting, you know, coopers and shoemakers to band together and set prices, but actively encouraging hundreds uh, to thousands of workers to collectively stop in industry. Less than a decade later, um, you're going to see a different union, the United Mine Workers or United Mine Workers of America. Sometimes it, you'll see it abbreviated as UMW. Sometimes it's abbreviated as UMWA. Less than 10 years later, you'll see the UMWA try to win similar concessions by organizing an entire industry. And this time it is the coal industry. Now, initially, the United Mine Workers was founded as kind of this merger between this progressive organization known as the National Progressive Miners Union and a Knights of Labor local in Ohio. The UMWA wasn't like a typical craft union, um, like the rest of uh, these unions associated with the American Federation of Labor. But at the same time, the UMWA argued that mining specifically was a, and of course it is, right, is a skill, uh, and that there is a certain amount of training and expertise and knowledge that you have to have going into the mines if you don't want to, you know, die, right? If you don't want a cave-in or an explosion to happen, if you don't want to suffocate on, on, um, on bituminous coal fumes, there's a certain amount of skill you need. And so the UMWA was able to kind of balance this line between, uh, between safety and technical skill, but also uh, also by uniting many, many different workers who had kind of been marginalized and excluded from the labor aristocracy, right? So in many ways, it's both a craft and an industrial union. Now, it breaks with this kind of craft unionism approach of the, uh, of the AFL, but because it's still a member organization, right, it's a part of the federation, these two organizations kind of help each other. So we don't have what's going on in the Pullman strike where the AFL and the ARU are at odds and saying, well, we're going to support the strike and the other federation is saying, well, we're not going to. So the UMWA and the AFL could have a tenuous organization, but they were still allied. And that, you know, uh, is ultimately going to be a pretty big difference here. So although the UMWA is trying to organize a lot of workers, they're still adopting a respectable, right, a respectability approach to organizing like the AFL does. The UMWA isn't calling for radical things like turning the mines over to workers' ownership. They're not saying that, uh, that industrial capitalism needs to be done away with, like more radical groups like the IWW will do. But they are arguing for increased mine safety, 
um, better compensation for miners. Either, uh, you know, stores that are free from company influence. So like these company stores that use this company script, you're getting rid of those or at least introducing um, the right of other companies to come in and, and not be tied to the corporation running a company town, right? To, so workers' living standards will improve. The UMWA prior to 1902 had won a lot of uh, modest gains in smaller coal mines in the Midwest, right? Places like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan, um, where there were smaller coal mining operations. Because these coal mining operations were smaller and these companies running coal mines were smaller, it was easier for the UMWA to lead a strike against them and successfully kind of secure wins for workers, right? These smaller companies don't have as big of a war chest as some of these larger mining companies uh, and industries out in like West Virginia or Pennsylvania. And so while the UMWA is starting to get these wins, they're doing so with the knowledge that now that these companies are paying more to their workers, right? Um, there's union wages, there's union benefits, there's, uh, there's safety precautions being taken in the mines. All of these things cost a little bit more money. And so these smaller companies are getting fewer profits. That's not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, right? The company is still profitable and the workers get a better share of the, of the profit for all of the work they're doing. But in national terms, these larger non-union mining operations out in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, or out west in places like Wyoming, they have to compete with those, right? And if your small mining operation is bringing in an extra $10,000 a year, but your non-union super corporate competitor is bringing in you know, $10 million a year, you're not going to remain your own independent operation for very long. And so that puts all of those union wins in jeopardy, right? The UMW is UMWA is faced with this situation where if they don't keep organizing larger coal fields, larger coal companies, all of the successes that they've won up until now are, in, are jeopardized. It's a map of these different coal mining regions throughout the United States. So in keeping with this respectability approach, the UMWA actually tried to avoid a strike, right? They went to um, these different coal companies that were, that were running these different anthracite coal mines. And they said, hey, let's negotiate in good faith, you know, uh, in front of the government and popular, you know, the, the population, popular oversight in front of God and everyone will talk about how we can uh, make sure that mines are more safe and how workers are better compensated. This willingness to openly negotiate um, gave the UMWA a, a, an improved degree of public trust, right? You know, up until this point, unions were kind of viewed as these, uh, these clandestine organizations. It's not because they were, you know, unions were trying to overthrow the government or anything, but because uh, there weren't any employment protections like we have today that are nominally tied to the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, right? Back then, if you were in a union, you could be fired, period. As a matter of fact, back then, if you were in a union, you might get shot and there just wouldn't be too deep of an investigation into it. So a lot of these unions actually were clandestine in order to protect their membership but that could come off as kind of conspiratory to the general population not involved in the labor movement. And so when the UMWA said, hey, we'll negotiate with you in, in, in the open, a lot of people liked that. This actually occurred around the same time as the ascendancy of um, the progressive governments, right? So as we start to enter the 20th century, we are in this period known as the Gilded Age where there's a lot of income disparity the very rich make a lot of money and everyone else doesn't make a lot of money. And this leads to wider social problems, right? If you don't have a, a, a wide, um, dependable tax base, you can't do things like build sewers. You can't run public schools. You can't run quality hospitals. You can't do, uh, kind of put a lot of, um, a lot of public resources into things like public works. And so 
because you have this rapid industrialization, because you have this rapid urbanization of the country, you see a lot of people coming immediately face to face with a lot of these social problems, right? If there's no sewer, you just have bad things in the street just kind of thrown into alleys that breeds disease. And so there's a political movement in the US going around at the time called uh, the progressive movement or the progressive era. You have a lot of social reform causes tied to the progressive era. Women's suffrage is kind of like this capstone uh, piece at the end of the progressive era where women get the right to vote. But eight hour the eight hour day, child labor reform laws, all of these things are being um, that are being advocated by the movement, the labor movement, are also being viewed as social ills that are um, that people in the progressive movement want to be taken care of. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the progressive movement and the labor movement are allies with each other, right? The progressive movement specifically kind of organizes around this idea of providing, um, of maintaining uh, the status quo in industrialization by providing for social reforms. Labor movements don't really want that status quo necessarily. They want increased agency and bargaining power for workers. So sometimes the progressive movement and the labor movement aren't going to, aren't going to be on the same page. But in this instance, with this, uh, with this popular support for the UMWA, um, Theodore Roosevelt's progressive government isn't necessarily jumping to take a pro-business stance the way earlier governments in the Gilded Age have, right? Now, coal industry leaders flatly refuse to negotiate with the union, very similar to Pullman. Um, there is this uh, national kind of cons uh, consensus in the business world that property rights are sacrosanct and that businesses don't really have to you know, um, kowtow to any kind of government or union in order to operate, right? We own the mines, we own the machines, uh, we set the rates, and if you don't like it, go somewhere else. This ultimately doesn't really work well for the anthracite coal industry. And this is because specifically the kind of coal that they are mining is anthracite coal. You might be asking, well, what's the difference there? Well, in heavy industry, right, to power things like uh, like railroad engines, steamships, um, in order to power like these massive machines in these manufactories that are springing up around the country, you have this very kind of dirty, um, heavy coal called bituminous coal. And bituminous coal, um, it's, not, it's not clean burning. It's rather smelly. It's not good to breathe in, um, but it has more power to it. And so the industrial uh, economy is more or less dependent on bituminous coal. Anthracite coal, on the other hand, is not as powerful. Um, you can't shovel a bunch of anthracite coal into a railroad engine and expect to go 120 miles an hour down these tracks, right? It's just not that powerful. But what anthracite coal does is it burns cleanly. And so prior to uh, natural gas or... Um, the widespread availability of petroleum uh, is a form of heating, right? Uh, before solar panels or a lot of wind turbines. In order to heat their homes, Americans burned anthracite coal. Well, when these companies refuse to negotiate with the workers, even though these workers are coming out through the UMWA in good faith and saying, hey, we want to discuss these in the open with you and just in good terms, kind of figure out how we can get the mining industry to work for everyone. When these companies say no, go ahead and strike, that puts the strike on the onus of the company, doesn't it? As the strike drags on uh, and the United Mine Workers continue to reach out a hand and say, hey, come in, come and talk with us. We want to end the strike. Let's negotiate. Every single time the companies, these companies like the anthracite involved in the anthracite coal trust kind of slap their hand away and say, no, you know, return to work when you want, where you can wait it out. we get closer and closer to winter. And more and more Americans are starting to worry about, well, how am I going to keep heat my home, right? If you live in New York City, you can't just go to Central Park and chop a tree down. One, if everyone did that, all the trees would be gone immediately. And two, well, now where are you gonna go? So there's a lot of Americans, because they live in these urbanized, industrialized areas, they just can't, they're not self-sufficient like people who uh, had been a generation before living on these small family farms might have been. And so they're very much tied to 
the coal industry. And if the coal industry isn't willing to end the strike and negotiate, that means they might be freezing to death in the winter. And so increasingly, public, uh, public pressure is put not only on the Anthracite Coal Trust, but on Theodore Roosevelt's progressive government to solve this social problem. And ultimately, this is what happens. Theodore Roosevelt comes out and says, look, unless you agree to end the strike and bargain in good faith with the mine workers, um, we're going to nationalize the coal industry. The government will come in and take it over and we'll just settle the strike on, on good terms. And so these anthracite coal companies are forced to negotiate with the mine workers because of public support and well, we don't want to go so far as to say governmental support, kind of this uh, impartiality on the side of government in a labor dispute. So it's important to distinguish again that, well, the progressive movement and Theodore Roosevelt's progressive government wasn't always uh, in support of the idea of collective bargaining or unionization, right? They were very much still tied to the idea of of productive, um, you know, the Protestant work ethic and productive capitalism and all these things, you know, property rights are sacrosanct. They didn't support the idea of collective bargaining in and of itself. But because citizens demanded the state to solve social and economic problems, the government was, you know, kind of forced into taking a less, you know, overly hostile, you know, stance towards the labor movement. And so ultimately, the, union, the UMWA and the Anthracite Coal Strike teaches us that public support for union actions and striking workers, even if the government itself is pro-business, can, um, can ultimately be the, the final pendulum swing in what pushes a labor strike or a labor action to success. Now, the anthracite coal strike doesn't end with major companies involved in the anthracite coal mining industry recognizing the UMWA. That was one of their goals. That doesn't happen. So some in the UMWA view it as a defeat. However, at the same time, you start to see increased safety regulations, increased safety precautions being taken in mines, and you start to see um, laws regulating uh, child's labor be introduced uh, to the mines. Up until uh, the anthracite coal strike, it was very common for, you know, once you were eight years old and you could pull a mine cart, you know, you had to go down there. Um, because of the labor movement and because of the progressive state and because of public pressure on the progressive state, you start to see this, uh, this fact of life um, begin to change, right? Suddenly it's less palatable to send a seven-year-old down to work uh, in the coal mines for 14 hours of hard labor. And that comes out of the labor movement being willing and able to get, um, to use public pressure to its own ends. So we've talked about Pullman, we've talked about the anthracite coal strike, and now we should spend some time on the bread and roses strike. Now, despite these gradual gains in worker safety that you start to see the labor movement make during the progressive era, overall workers still don't have a lot of protections. Oftentimes, whenever there are demands made for greater safety controls or when people call um, on wellness provisions to be made for workers, you know, we might uh, jump back to that poor gentleman in uh, Loomis's first, second chapter discussing the Great Railroad Strike, where he, you know, um, falls off a train and loses an arm. There's not any sort of workers' compensation set aside for him. There's, you know, there's not disability. There's not Social Security at this time. Social Security is still quite a few decades away. So whenever these kinds of safety controls or, like, provisions are won on, you know, these small city, you know, levels, they're very quickly and effectively challenged by companies in the court system, which uh, still kind of leans to the right and in, in favor of, of company property rights over collective uh, people's rights, right? In New York City, the Women's Trade Union League, or WTUL, in a different union, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, or ILGWU, 
begin to campaign for legislative protections that would further curb child labor and force companies to adopt some minimal protections guaranteeing workplace safety. Now, the WTL and the ILGWU um, are not working in the mines. And so there can be this public perception that the work that women textile workers are doing, that chi the children are doing in the textile industry, you know, will a 14 hour day in a textile mill is not desirable. It's certainly not as dangerous as a mine in West Virginia, right? And so there's perhaps uh, a little bit reduced public pressure uh, supporting, supporting these initiatives. And that can lead, of course, to some of these, uh, some of these laws being one being quickly overturned and uncontested. There was a, uh, a law in New York that basically set the maximum hours um, of work in a day at 10. I believe it was 10, it might've been 12. And then, you know, furthermore set that the maximum amount of hours you can work in a week was 60. So it was 10 hours a day for six days a week. That was the most amount of hours you could work in a week. Manufacturing companies challenged that and in uh, the Supreme Court decision Lochner v. New York, that very small New York City uh, statute that set maximum amount of hours was struck down as unconstitutional, right? Everyone is free to decide uh, how much money they want to work for, even if it's below um, uh, what I would be willing to work for. And everyone has the freedom you know, to, uh, to work for as long as they want for any employer they want. If that's 16 hour days, you know, if, a, if a worker is willing to, to do that, then they have the right to do it. It's very kind of Ayn Rand objectivist in its reasoning. But the legal apparatus is striking down of these different provisions uh, also leads to some tragedies. In 1911, um, one of these uh, manufacturers in New York City that had been willing to avoid implementing any sort of like safety regulations called the Triangle Waste Company, they had a sweatshop in Greenwich Village, which is kind of down the, you know, not it, it's not in like Tribeca and like the heart of Manhattan, but it's, you know, it's closer to the center of the city. Now, this building caught, catches fire. Depends on who you ask how it starts. Um, you know, there's, there's some contestation about that. But the fire, you know, regardless of how it starts, the fire quickly begins to spread. And these women workers working for the Triangle Waste Company try to leave uh, the workshop. However, they can't because the doors to the factory are chained shut. You might say, hey, that's, that's a fire hazard. You're right. Very clearly it is a fire hazard. But there are no laws stipulating that uh, that employers have to have fire exits or have to keep egresses to a building uh, clear in the event of a fire, right? That would, you know, impose undue restrictions on the free market. Triangle Waste Company and a lot of other sweatshop companies like this would actually specifically uh, institute policies of chaining doors closed so that workers wouldn't be able to sneak off to the bathroom on company time or sneak off for a break on company time when the company was paying them to, you know, sew pants or show, you know, triangle shirtwaists. The factory owners were absolutely convinced that workers were taking, uh, were taking needles and string home with them in their, uh, in their clothing, that they were hiding them in their, on their person or that they were walking out of these factories with like bolts of, of extra scrap fabric, and that if they had chained the doors shut, that they would be able to stop this process. In the resulting fire, well over 100 workers died. Um, almost 100 more were seriously injured. And it was a fairly graphic scene uh, for the entire city of New York. The fire burned um, throughout the day and witnesses going down uh, to see the Triangle Shirtwaist building on fire remarked about how women who were trapped up on the seventh, and sixth, seventh, and eighth floors, you know, rather than burning to death, uh, would jump out of the building onto the street below. Uh, if you want to imagine the kind of horror that we remember on 9-11, when the news was broadcasting very similar images, 
uh, is kind of the, the scene that New Yorkers were greeted with um, at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. There was a trial not long after the fire, and the owners of Triangle were found not guilty of second-degree manslaughter charges. This kind of demonstrates this, in, this entrenched pro-business uh, court system that's existing at the time. Um, even though the progressive movement is in full swing by the time the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire happens, uh, the Supreme Court had been packed more or less by more conservative administrations earlier on in the Gilded Age, right, when this income disparity had start to, started to really blossom. And so even though there's a shift in government, this conservative court remains, and it's, uh, you see these men ultimately, uh, they get to go free because they technically didn't violate any laws. There's no law against chaining workers up in a, in a building. So even though these men go, through, they go free, though, the New York State Legislature starts to put together a more robust industrial um, inspection apparatus. They create the Factory Investigating Commission, which starts to uh, enforce some minimal safety standards in the city, like, hey, um, you need to have the doors not locked, or maybe you need to have fire escapes, you know, very minimal kind of safety standards that could, that could have saved the 146 women and children that died at Triangle. So you do start to see some gradual progress here, right? The UMWA and the ILGWU are starting to actually win some serious legislative gains. At the same time, however, these gains are moving along very slowly. So if you think about 1911, right? Um, if Pullman was in 1893, 1894, and it is now almost 1914, it has been 20 years. And there are, uh, you know, more or less, very soon to be 20 years, 18, 20 years. You could have been born on the day Pullman took off and, and when triangle is, burning down, triangle is burning down, you could have been, you know, uh, years lived in your life and there are still workers dying of very preventable causes. And so you start to see more militant unions uh, emerging at the time, making criticisms of the labor movement, pointing to slow progress and saying there's something more than these, than these smaller strikes and court challenges needs to be done, right? The politics of respectability aren't winning is enough victories and we aren't saving enough lives and so something needs to be done. And this is when you start to see 1905 groups like the IWW call for a more, um, a more radical approach to organizing and towards society in general, right? So if you are a member of the IWW and you're looking at the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, you're going to say, hey, it's great that now in New York City, some buildings are going to be required to have fire escapes. Does that protect textile workers in Baltimore? Does that protect railroad workers in St. Louis? Well, no, of course it doesn't. And so well, there are small victories, there need to be larger ones. Again, kind of coming back to the IWW and this Continental Congress of the Working Class and Big Bill Haywood with one eye, always has the scowl on his face, you see him up there in the top image. They start to advocate for a new economic organization um, that would break away from the current system of industrial capitalism. Now, this could be expressed as one big union. The IWW referred to itself as the one big union. It styled itself as a one big union. It would, um, for the most part, welcome anyone who wanted to join. If you were a manager or a supervisor, even if you didn't own a factory, but if you were supervising workers, they probably would not allow you into the IWW. But they advocated specifically uh, early on in the history of industrial unionism that contrary to craft unionism, which provided uh, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, industrial, uh, industrial unionism, at least according to the IWW, would replace the wage system, right? Recall these earlier critiques of the wage system as a form of wage slavery, 
And in lieu of a kind of industrial capitalist system, the IWW wanted uh, instead a system of industrial democracy, right? So in contrast to industrial capitalism, you have industrial democracy. And that is a system where any kind of economic decision-making process uh, is at least partially controlled um, and influenced by uh, in a union or some other working class organization. Now for the IWW, industrial democracy uh, was more or less what we might view as Marxism today. They didn't call it communism or socialism. Specifically, the IWW argued for uh, the creation of syndicalism, where you would replace all of these, you, you know, the, all of these industries like the mining industry with syndicates. And uh, so you'd have a mining syndicate, you would have a textile syndicate, and these different syndicates, which were basically run by unions, would hypothetically, you know, um, have a legislative body that controlled the government. So it's essentially the IWW wanted to take representative democracy and extend it to the economy. So a lot in common with Marx, um, but some variances in their approach. Not everyone advocating for industrial unionism viewed industrial democracy this way. Um, later on into the Great Depression, but even before then, and kind of at this point now, there are individuals and organizations that kind of walked a middle line between the AFL and the IWW who said, you know, there should be, uh, there should be unions, there should be industrial unions, and they should have a say in the in decision-making processes, right? How factories are run and what the rates are and what kind of products are made, all of these things, the union should have a say in, but maybe they shouldn't control everything. Regardless of you or if in the IWW or one of these more moderate industrial unions, calling for industrial democracy and industrial unionism put you very quickly at odds with the kind of the established order of things. If you ran a company, if you had your own store, you're probably not going to support industrial democracy, right? Because it means giving up your own power to the people you employ. You know, I built this mill. You know, you didn't, the, the bricklayers and the masons did. But I own this mill. I paid for this mill. I paid for these machines. And so they're mine and the workers don't have any right to them. I pay them for the labor they do and they should be happy for that. Right, so industrial democracy is not what you want. If you're a politician, Usually uh, in politics, you benefit from maintaining a kind of status quo or improving it slightly. Radical change is not something that's usually advocated uh, for successfully in the democratic process, though there all, are always examples of that. But if you're a politician, you're probably not going to sign on with the IWW syndicalism, especially if in you know, the press, popular culture, the media, they're kind of portrayed as these very wild, radical, bomb-throwing lunatics. You, know, you don't want to be associated with that. If you're going to be associated with the labor movement, it needs to be the AFL. And so the IWW is pretty much immediately at odds with kind of this entrenched uh, bureaucracy in, in the economy, in the labor movement, and in government. But the IWW's radicalism also serves it in a lot of meaningful ways. Specifically, the IWW's willingness to include members regardless of their race or their religion, though the IWW did specifically argue that religion was not something that, that people should take seriously. They wouldn't kick you out if you were a Christian. Uh, if you were a, a woman worker, if you were a, an immigrant worker from East Europe or you know, East Asia, regardless of all of these things, or if you were skilled or unskilled, the IWW would usually accept you. And this is very helpful for them because a lot of the groups, uh, a lot of the different demographic groups and communities that end up uh, joining the IWW do so because they had been overlooked by the AFL's craft unionism for so long, this kind of approach to organizing that only focused on the skilled workers and kind of uh, you know, contributed and maintained the system of the labor aristocracy. So the IWW would organize immigrant workers who spoke a lot of different languages. You know, if you ever, if, when the Ruther Archive here on campus opens up, if you ever want to go 
um, see some of these early IWW newspapers. They're in many different languages, you know, Yiddish, Slovakian, German, Polish, Lithuanian, Russian. There was a lot of effort being made to reach out to workers uh, across many different uh, language barriers. Women workers with labor, feminist ideals of sex and gender equality, well, they would be kind of um, paraded out of most AFL locals, were kind of accepted into the mainstream of the IWW. That's not to say that there wasn't sexism in the IWW. Sometimes, uh, you know, these quote unquote movement men on the left can be more sexist than than a churchgoer, depending on the circumstances. But all of these things start to give a lot of credibility to the IWW for a group of people that had been left out by the labor movement up until this point, more or less. So from its initial founding in 1905 until it's uh, 12 years later at its organizational height, the, UA the uh, IWW gains you know, a little more than 150,000 members, which is pretty substantial. And because of this growth, they're able to start challenging the AFL in a series of some in a series of notable strikes. And one of the pretty significant ones that comes less than a year after the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire is the Lawrenceville or the Lawrence, Massachusetts uh, textile workers strike, which is also called the Bread and Roses strike. Now the Bread and Roses strike actually started off when workers tried uh, to organize through the legislature, through political lobbying, electoral politics, through craft unions, they got the state of Massachusetts to limit the work week to 54 hours a week. It had previously sat at 56 or 58, you know, so they had it cut down to 54. That's only, um, you know, nine, eight hour days. No, uh, fast math is hard. What is 54 divided by nine? I don't have a calculator, but it's more than a 40 hour work week. So they had it brought down to 54 hours, um, down from 58 or 56. And the expectation when this measure passed in the Massachusetts legislature was that workers would, be, would continue to, to make the pay that they had made. They would just be working two to four hours less in a week. In Lawrenceville, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, where some of the largest American uh, textile mills are in operation. Lawrence is, of course, a company town in this regard. These mills start cutting checks uh, when, these, when these laws go into effect. And across the board, mill workers find that they are, instead of being paid per day, are now suddenly being paid per hour, right? Used to be you would go in for your 12-hour shift and you would leave with an X amount of money. And now that it's a 10 hour shift, you're going in and you're coming out and suddenly your pay is less. And it's like, wait a minute, I didn't have an hourly rate. I had a daily rate. This of course wasn't true for everyone, but kind of see how like some of these companies can start playing with math to, to justify decreases in wages. Workers walked out of the factory and after mill owners refused to bargain, the, I, the IWW announced a, um, a strike in the city of Florence. And they began picketing Lawrence's largest textile mills to demand the reinstatement of the original wage, right? So they're not even asking for a wage hike. They're just saying, we want to keep the same amount of money we were being paid, commiserate with this reduced amount of hours that has been negotiated by the legislature as we believed would happen. And so, you know, we'll come back when you, when you do that. A lot of people looked at the IWW as a very radical fringe organization and expected the strike to collapse pretty quickly, but it doesn't. Defying expectations and beginning a strike kind of in the dead of one of the most brutal winters of the decade, the strike lasts into late March, defying expectations of that quick collapse by the AFL. The AFL at the time, of course, um, well, kind of breaking away from refusing to organize unskilled workers did maintain that, you know, hey, because this group of workers is, you know, they're immigrant workers, they're ethnically diverse, there's women there. The AFL just maintained that those workers were unorganizable and didn't really try to represent them. After the IWW organizes them, the AFL moves into Lawrence 
and attempts to negotiate on behalf of the striking workers through its own dual union, right? We talked about dual unionism sometimes. It's when a company organizes its own employee association to kind of take away power from a labor union. A dual union can be when a more radical organization attempts to supplant uh, a more kind of entrenched bureaucratic union. In this instance, it's the AFL trying to move in and kind of uh, usurp the IWW's organizing base. The United Textile Workers, which is a part of the AFL, moves into Lawrence and tries to negotiate a contract with the mill owners. The mill owners aren't willing to concede enough, and the contract that the UTW eventually gives workers is just flatly rejected. These mills start to lean pretty heavily on the local police and uh, accounts of police brutality start to be widely circulated in, in uh, press syndicates loyal to the IWW and the labor movement. And so you start to see uh, increased public scrutiny on the city of Lawrence and how it starts treating these striking workers. The IWW finally uh, tilts, kind of tilts the, the scales of public sympathy when they do this, uh, this, camp, this highly publicized campaign called the Children's Exodus. Now throughout the strike, a lot of uh, municipal improvement associations and uh, economic development councils, right, these very like well-to-do kind of city organizations are pretty harshly criticizing the IWW, right? You know, all, you're encouraging all of these workers to go on strike that they have, you know, children at home and those children have mouths to feed and like, look at all of these, uh, you know, there's so, that won't somebody please think of the children. The IWW is being irresponsible. They're, in they're endangering children. So the IWW says, you're right, you're right. They shouldn't be in Lawrence. We should move these children to other nearby towns with families sympathetic to the strike to make sure that they're, you know, well-fed and taken care of, that they're in a home that has heat that they're able to go to school and read. And so the IWW organizes this children's exodus where they march children in Lawrence to the train station to ship them off to places like New York City or Boston, you know, these larger cities where you have other IWW members willing to take them in and provide them with a home during the duration of the strike. Pretty quickly realizing that this is not good optics for the city of Lawrence, the police meet the children at the train station and proceed to bludgeon them and drive them away from the train station. This actually uh, results in worse optics for Lawrence as political cartoons like the one you see here begin uh, to be widely circulated nation nationally. This only adds to further public scrutiny um, mill owners are brought up in congressional hearings, and they eventually settle the strike with the IWW, providing mill workers with wage increases beyond those the AFL had tried to provide them with um, through the United Textile Workers. So the strike wins. That being said, because the IWW placed little emphasis on contract bargaining and organizational development, uh, these gains don't really last. Recall the IWW isn't really out to have uh, a wage system for you know a fair day's uh, wage for a fair day's work. The IWW doesn't stand behind that like the AFL does. The IWW wants industrial democracy. So they have a very brief victory in Lawrence, but the IWW doesn't really stay around. They go on to organize other places and advocate for syndicates and the you know, the righteous people's overthrow of, of capitalism to be replaced with a democratic worker state. All these kind of abstract concepts that weren't immediately tied to the bread and butter issues of, the, of workers at different parts of the country. And so after these, uh, these wins by the textile workers in Lawrence are cemented, the IWW is more or less driven out of the city. The Bread and Rose uh, teach, uh, strike teaches us that when union organizing campaigns are waged effectively and inclusively, workers of all races, creeds, religions, genders, they can work in solidarity and they can take on powerful companies to demand better worker representation and rights. At the same time, though, you could also say that the Bread and Rose strike teaches us that a union needs to have a certain degree of bureaucracy um, and organizational stability 
in order to make sure that the, the victory of workers' strikes are maintained, right? Sometimes, um, especially recently, people will kind of criticize unions for being too bureaucratic and not responsive enough and kind of like bloated. You know, the UAW is too big. Look at all of its, uh, all of the office workers that work at Solidarity House. And you kind of have to process a lot of paperwork when you're representing 350,000 workers. The last major strike we're going to talk about today was the, is the Colorado Coalfield War. It takes place kind of toward the end of 1913 into the spring of 1914. This one doesn't take place in Pennsylvania. It uh, takes place out west. Mining wasn't an industry that was exclusive to the industrial northeast. You actually have mining and a lot of other resource extractive industries counting for a pretty sizable portion of the economy in some of these western states, right? It's not just mining, but like, you know, logging, stone quarrying. There is, of course, the railroad industry runs through a lot of disparate places in the west. You have these railroad towns, kind of these uh, way stations for, for freight shipment going throughout the, the continent. So you have a lot of resource extractive industries. And they kind of revolve around some very hard laboring lifestyles, right? If you think about uh, the West, even before the labor movement, if you think about this kind of uh, stereotypical Wild West country, um, that doesn't change with the end of, you know, Western migration and the Indian Wars and kind of like this violence where, uh, where cattle ranchers and settlers would you know, battle with uh, indigenous native and, and Mexican people who had already been living in the area. The West doesn't just suddenly become this very peaceful place because of this. There's kind of this entrenched character that kind of revolves around, you know, performative masculinity and violence. And as the labor movement starts to grow and go West, it takes on an added kind of very violent anti-labor stance as well. If you're a labor organizer out West, uh, if you were uncovered or ran afoul of the wrong person, you might be shot. You might be tarred and feathered or tied to a train and rode out of town. And labor competition between unions uh, could be just as violent and divisive in these Western states, perhaps even more so than in the Eastern states. United Mine Workers has this tacit alliance with the AFL. Um, but if the UMWA kind of leans too much into these politics of respectability, there are other competing labor organizations that don't buy into that as much who might, you know, start to criticize it for, you know, being in, you know, sometimes they would say, well, you're in bed with management or, you know, you're, uh, you're working for the police. So the UMWA, especially out West, can't lean too hard into this kind of respectability approach that they took in the anthracite coal strike. More militant organizations like the Western Federation of Miners, which are closely tied to the IWW, actually the WFM and the IWW had as kind of leading figures, uh, Bill Haywood, who you see down in that bottom picture. He always kind of has this, uh, this squint going on where he closes his right eye. It's because he lost that eye. He would tell you it was because of a labor dispute, but supposedly he lost it in a, uh, a whittling accident. He was uh, making a slingshot with a knife and blighted himself. Depending on the historian you ask, they're going to give you a different story. So the UMWA is kind of being pressured on both sides here, right? There is this this desire to be respectable. Um, but if they're too respectable, especially in this kind of violent anti-labor atmosphere of the West, they're going to lose their members because they're going to be viewed as very ineffectual. And so after years of harsh work for little pay, the UMWA realizes that it needs to start challenging the power of some of these largest mining companies in these Western states, right? If we can't unionize through legal means, maybe we're going to have to take it a step further realistically if we're ever going to win labor contestations out, out west. And this is especially true when companies themselves would openly embrace illegal means to break strikes, right? A company could bribe police to look the other way as you extrajudicially murder a union organizer. 
you might uh, pay a, a federal investigator or a state investigator to overlook, you know, your violation of child labor laws or your violation of um, safe laws regarding safe working conditions. Even beyond that, a lot of companies would just hire their own private armies. They were like Pinkerton detective agencies. They would hire retired uh, National Guardsmen to basically serve as their own private armies. These private armies would basically break up labor strikes, uh, break up union camps, um, march scab labor, or people who were willing to break strikes. They would uh, march them under armed guard to, to the mines to make sure they could do their work. In 1913, the UMWA launches a series of strikes in Southern Colorado. At this point, the state's unemployment rate hovers around 8.2%. It's not, it's not a great rate of unemployment. Um, today, our unemployment rate is a little above that, and these are considered pretty disparate times. But by 1914, you know, the next year, uh, the economy sours. And so that 8.2 kind of overnight doubles to 16.4. The U.S. kind of before uh, market regulations and controls on finance and banking and industry, the U.S. has this ongoing relationship with economic growth and crashes, right, called boom and bust. So every few years, the market would grow very rapidly. People would get rich and the market would reach critical mass and you would have a bust, right? So something akin, not as bad as the Great Depression, but pretty bad, you know, the economy would collapse. You would have, you know, every 10, 15, ever even 20 years, if you're lucky, every, you know, couple so often, you would have this economic uh, calamity and uh, the, the, the economy would start to pick itself up back from this. And so in 1914, you start to see one of these collapses. Now, the largest mining companies in the state would refuse to recognize the mine workers, uh, the union, or really any union uh, that sought to represent workers. So not just the UMWA, but the WFM, uh, which was you know, affiliated with the, the Wobblies or the, the uh, IWW and Big Bill Haywood. You know, it doesn't matter if you're radical or, or reasonable. We're not going to negotiate with you. If you start striking, we're just going to start using our own private armies to send in these, uh, these scab laborers to break your strike. Ultimately, the United Mine Workers did not have a lot of pretty radical demands. The mine workers wanted the union to be a, you know, the recognized representative of workers in bargaining. It's pretty common for today that if you organize into a union, that that union is seen as your bargaining representative. They wanted this out west. They wanted um, a more amicable rate at which they were compensated for digging coal. Jobs would advertise that, hey, for every, you know, every ton of coal that you and your team get, you get X amount of pay. You would go to your job site and you would get uh, you know, 8,000 pounds of coal and think, all right, we got four tons. We're going to be paid for four tons. And then you would get to these weigh stations. You'd be told, well, actually, we're using this kind of antiquated unit of measurement called a long ton. And a long ton is more than a regular ton. And so you're actually going to be paid less. They wanted to get rid of that. They wanted enforcement of the eight-hour workday law. The eight-hour workday law had uh, had been depending on the state you were in, um, had been passed, kind of ratified, passed through the legislature. But that doesn't mean that the eight hour workday was enforced, right? The law might say that your, that your day was eight hours, but if the police weren't willing to enforce it, if they were being paid off by the company, and if the company's armed guards told you your workday was 11 hours, well then your workday was, was 11 hours. Workers wanted payment for something called dead work. So workers were expected to lay, lay track in the mines, to cut down trees, timbering, um, to deal with impurities in the rock, basically to the processing of coal. Um, these were all things that were not tasks directly associated with mining. 
And so the company would not pay or compensate workers for doing that work. They called it dead work. You know, you're not actively mining, so we're not going to pay you for any of this, even though you are working for us. There were accusations that the weight checkmen who were, you know, measuring these, these ton rates of coal were, were underwriting, you know, using faulty scales, were finding ways to, to compensate workers less. Workers wanted weight checkmen to be elected to make sure that they were, you know, trustworthy. Something akin to a shop steward today, how you elect your shop stewards if you're in a union. The right to use any store or to choose boarding houses and doctors, you know, this company town issue where you're kind of tied to a general store and company scrip and your own dormitory. Workers wanted to get rid of that. And of course, again, enforcement of state laws regarding mine safety and, you know, company scrip the end to the company guard system, all of these things that were technically illegal, but that the company just decided weren't. Now, the biggest offender in Colorado at the time was called Colorado Fuel and Iron, or CF&I. It was certainly among the most egregious employers. It was tied to J.D. Rockefeller, I believe, out east. It's from J.D. Rockefeller. Andrew Carnegie was, uh, he was in the steel industry. So J.D. Rockefeller out, uh, out east, kind of one of these titans of, of industrial capitalism, who uh, was one of the more prominent detractors of the labor movement. The Western Federation of Miners and the IW, you know, before the WFM had joined and morphed into the IWW two years uh, before it was founded. This mining group that Big Bill Haywood was in charge of tried to organize workers at CF&I in 1903. They were brutally crushed. CF&I hired contingents of um, retired National Guardsmen. They bought them an armored car with a machine gun in the back called the Death Special. These company guards and these National Guardsmen would drive the Death Special out to these uh, Union camps and just shoot the machine gun indiscriminately over the camp tents, you know, keeping it pretty low to the ground, but making sure not to hit anyone at least not hit anyone so that you could be tied to it. 1903, the WFM strike is crushed. And in 1913 and 1914, as the UMWA starts to organize workers in Southern Colorado to demand these reforms, make the company operate legally, these National Guardsmen and these private detectives come out in force again with this death special and start to repeat a lot of their tactics that they had 10 years earlier. Despite this though, because of the UMW's wins in other parts of the country, as one of these first successful industrial unions, they have a much larger war chest than companies are used to when they're dealing with, with craft unions, right? Craft unions are smaller. They don't have as many resources. And other industrial unions like the IWW are too radical to get a lot of supplies together. But the UMWA represents a pretty big challenge here because they have enough resources to keep a strike going for a long time. So starting off in 1913 and well into the spring of 1914, this, uh, this Colorado coal strike is flaring up in various degrees of violence. You know, you have pitched skirmishes between unions and scabs um, and these company detectives and law enforcement and the National Guard. And, you know, it's, you might walk into a, a valley and see some men camping in front of a fire and not know if they're National Guardsmen and they're gonna shoot you because they think you're in the IWW, or if they're IWW men and they're gonna shoot you because they think you're a scab. In March of 1914, in one of these tent colonies near the city of Forbes, there's a body of a strike breaker is uncovered. The National Guard uh, was touring the area with a congressional committee at the time. National Guard told the committee that the, uh, that the strike tent colony was harboring the murderers of the strike breakers. You might be asking, why were they in tents? Well, if you have a company town, the only forms of residence are these company, uh, are these you know dormitories that are run by the company. If you go on strike, well, they're going to evict you, right? You can't live at this house unless you're working for this company. And now that you're on strike, you're fired, you need to leave. 
So a lot of times some of these labor actions would, uh, these unionists, these union men and women and their, you know, their families, their children, they would set up these tent colonies nearby the city where they used to live. The hope being that when the strike was settled, they would be allowed to return. Now, whether or not this colony was actually harboring the murder of the strike breaker, we're probably never going to know. But the National Guard is kind of, you know, they take it upon themselves to retaliate. And they, uh, a few days later, they attack the colony. Well, most of its inhabitants are away at a, at a picket. They arrest 16 men, the only 16 men who they can find living there, and they burn down the rest of the camp. Of course, when they set fire to these uh, these tents, they are they do so without the knowledge that there are two newborn children inside of these tents. This leads to some national outrage. As one would expect after the National Guard, you know, burned two infants alive, tensions don't really go away. They actually start to rise a little bit. And toward the end of April, there is another standoff, this time at a camp near the town of Ludlow. Now, the earlier incident at the Forbes tent colony, right? The earlier incident at the Forbes tent colony does not go well for the National Guard. They receive a lot of criticism. And so going into the standoff at Ludlow, there are other, uh, there are accusations that the workers at Ludlow are holding a strike breaker against his will. You know, we're not sure that he's, that they've killed him, but we know he's there and we have to go get him, you know, save his life. Not sure if there's any actual evidence that they were keeping a strike breaker against his will at this camp, but that's the, uh, the accusation that's made. Strike leaders go out to negotiate with these National Guardsmen in a field. While this is happening, a separate National Guard contingent moves around a hill near the back of the camp and installs a machine gun. And then claiming that they were shot at, but you know, this is disputed by the UMWA, claiming they were shot at, these National Guardsmen open fire on the Ludlow camp. The striking miners, once a machine gun is being, you know, aimed at their not very bulletproof tents, uh, and they're being fired upon, they of course return fire. Leaders of the strike aren't able to rein in the violence. You might be asking why? Well, when they were out in this field negotiating with these National Guardsmen, there is a kerfuffle something happens and the leaders of the strike are later found dead. It's worth noting that the strike leaders are found lying face down in the dirt with bullets in, the, in their backs and in the backs of their heads, suggesting that they went to return to the Ludlow camp and were uh, executed by the National Guard. This is a claim that the UMW made, though the National Guard uh, would contest this claim. Later archaeological evidence seems to suggest that the UMWA's account of things is more accurate. But specifically what happens here, well, we might never know. This battle between strikers and the National Guard lasts for the remainder of the day. And when the dust finally clears, uh, 20 camp residents, 12 of whom are children, had been killed. Um, fires had kind of swept through the camp, and so if people hadn't been shot by the machine gun fire, they had burned alive in these in these fires at the Ludlow, at what becomes the Ludlow Massacre. So you have this very gradual kind of uh, protracted series of skirmishes between the Union and the National Guard and this private army from CF and I. After the Ludlow Massacre, um, it it becomes a full war. The United Mine Workers kind of uh, realizing that uh, peaceful strikes might not actually get them what they're looking for in this Colorado Coalfield strike, arm themselves and in a 10 day kind of campaign, move from company town to company town in Southern Colorado, uh, fighting this private army and these, uh, these strike breaking workers and the National Guard series of pretty bloody skirmishes that lead to um, almost 200 deaths. The official death total that most historians agree on is actually 199 specifically. 
Sometimes it's a little less. Sometimes you have people putting that number a little higher over 200, but that's, you know, usually 199 is the, is the number. People are pretty shocked. J.D. Rockefeller, who is kind of the principal owner of CF&I, Colorado Fuel and Iron, he's kind of uh, denounced as really the person who's responsible, right? J.D. Rockefeller has kind of like this massive war chest and all of these resources at his disposal. He could have, you know, he's um, what political scientists would say is negotiating from a position of power, right? He, hold, he has all the cards. It's kind of contingent on him to find a way to end this peacefully, but he doesn't. He's never officially held accountable for his role in the violence, right? He's never, uh, he's never found guilty of any crime. He does successfully kind of crush the United Mine Workers unionization attempt here. Um, the UMWA doesn't emerge from the Colorado Cofield War as, uh, as, the, as the kind of recognized bargaining representative. But the violence uh, at Ludlow and in Southern Colorado throughout this period is kind of a watershed moment for the labor movement. A lot of times when people talk about the labor movement and they talk about um, some pretty key battles in the early labor movement's history that lead it to becoming a kind of um, recognized national political and economic force in this country. They'll point to these very early battles like the Colorado Coalfield War. Later on in 1921, you have the Battle of Blair Mountain. Compelled to act, representatives in government end up passing laws restricting, further restricting child labor. Uh, and many of the mining industry's more questionable practices. The Adamson Act of 1916 um, sets the eight hour workday as a federal standard and not just this kind of disparate uh, law that could be set or un, you know, kind of enacted or repealed in different states. All of these reforms might not have happened had it not been for the public outrage following the Colorado Coldfield War and the Ludlow Massacre. There were laws restricting child labor, there were laws establishing safety standards, and there were laws establishing the eight hour day, but they didn't necessarily go enforced, remember, right? And so this public outrage eventually leads members of government to recognize that the government has to take a more active role in the economy if these kinds of uh, these kinds of legislative protections are actually going to mean anything. The Colorado Coalfield War also teaches us that labor history is not always peaceful. Many of the labor movement's gains were and are paid for in violent struggle between the employer and the employed. Now, if you want to call this simply labor unrest. Sometimes you have to be willing to strike and strike and mean it to win a victory, or if you want to take this Marxist approach and call it you know, class conflict, whatever it is. Sometimes history is violent. And the Colorado Coalfield War kind of uh, reminds, this of, reminds us of this. So we have these four strikes, and they each teach us these four different lessons about um, the early American labor movement, the early history of industrial unionism. It's kind of tipping point of, of the labor movement that goes from being like this marginalized, kind of illegal, clandestine uh, organization that's not really viewed as um, compatible with democracy or the public good. Suddenly you see the labor movement very seriously taking on the interests of the American worker it starts to gain some legitimacy. Now that doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that every single shop in the US is gonna become a union shop and that suddenly unionization rates are gonna climb astronomically. You're actually going to, after this time, you're going to start seeing a decline in the American movement, labor movement, specifically following World War I. Now, we're not going to focus too much on World War I specifically. The US waits a while to get involved in it. Uh, World War I, of course, starts off in Europe in 1914. The US doesn't get involved until kind of the middle of 1917, and by the end of 1918, it's over. So the US misses most of it. 
that being said, World War I was so costly in terms of human life and finance and trade and all these standards uh, of living tied to the Western world, these kind of notions of the enlightenment and of logic and of reason, these ideas of human industrial progress. World War I kind of shakes these, these ideas, these conceptions. And a lot of Americans after World War I start to call for uh, a return to normalcy is how it's phrased, going into the 1920s, right? War had been costly, the progressive movement had, you know, uh, lobbied for so many of these new reforms. Labor unions had contributed to labor unrest, not only in, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, where these, you know, crazy wobblies in the IWW were trying to overthrow the government, but even, you know, nominally respectable unions like the United Mine Workers who had, who we uh, negotiated with back in 1902. Twelve years later, they're out in Colorado shooting the National Guard. What's going on? We need to take things back to normal is kind of this attitude. Now, the American government, the federal government, when it was conducting uh, its affairs in World War I, had assumed a number of special powers, right, to set and control production and price rates and, like, the, the finer points of um, industries that they viewed as kind of key to the war effort, right? Coal is a good example of this, right? If you're going to... If you're going to power, you know, coal-powered ocean liners to cross uh, the Atlantic and get troops to Europe, you need a reliable source of coal. If you're going to, if you're going to provide, you know, tens of to hundreds to even millions of of soldiers with uniforms, you need a dependable textile production apparatus. You know, if you're going to make sure that you have the supplies you need to conduct a war, you need to make sure that your key industries aren't constantly going on strike. And so in order to do this, the federal government sets up this, uh, this council called the Council of National Defense that kind of takes control of these key industries for a period of time. And this includes like a kind of a minimum wage type system that's set up by the War Committee on Labor, right? To make sure the mine workers and the textile workers and all these workers don't go on strike, we're going to give you a pretty decent wage. You know, These wages that you've been asking for for some time, we're going to pay you them. So don't go on strike or you'll regret it. Well, after the war, these price controls, these wage, uh, these wage rates are repealed, right? Government is returning to normalcy. And all of these uh, industries that had, you know, guaranteed X amount of workers, you know, so many hours of employment at this rate suddenly return uh, more to private hands. They start to say, no, now we're going, you know, this is the private market again. We're going to work longer hours. You're going to be paid less. Also get that union button off your uniform or we'll fire you. The American Federation of Labor, you know, uh, which had been, uh, had continued to be this very respectable kind of uh, craft union federation throughout the war. Had closely cooperated with the government and this national, uh, this this war labor council. When the government kind of retreats and goes back to this return to normalcy, the AFL doesn't like that, right? They kind of viewed this uh, this greater federal kind of. Uh, assumption of powers in the economy is, uh, is an arm of the progressive movement, though it wasn't necessarily. And so after the war, the uh, AFL goes uh, and launches a number of pretty major strikes in 1918, 1919, and 1920. Now, if you recall the 1877 Great Upheaval, right, this great railroad strike, the Paris Commune, this workers' uprising in Europe, really made Americans wary of something similar happening in the United States. You know, you had these workers in Paris barricading the street and shooting at the police and proclaiming their own government. And you can't have that here in America. We're a nation of law and order, right? We're that city on a hill that other countries look up to and aspire to be, which is what we tell ourselves. Well, in 1917, toward the end of World War I, you see something, you know, which... If you could take the Paris Commune and multiply it by 100, because there are a lot of major cities in Russia, you have that. And in 1917, the, the Russian aristocracy, the, the aristocratic monarchy in Russia is overthrown. There's a, a very tentative kind of unstable provisional 
government that tries to be democratic that's set up in, in uh, February and March of 1917. It keeps Russia in the war. People in Russia don't like being in the war. And so closer to the winter uh, in October or November, depending on which calendar you're using, there's another revolution. And so in Russia there, uh, you see kind of the creation of this first, uh, this first attempt at what the IWW is calling industrial democracy, right? You're doing away with private industry and you're replacing it with these, uh, these workers' councils. The IWW would call them syndicates. In Russia, this, uh, this Bolshevik political party calls them Soviets, right? A Soviet is basically a, a, uh, a city government that workers are running directly uh, at their work sites. It's where the name Union of Soviet Socialist Republics comes from. This idea of, of a Soviet or of what the IWW would call a syndicate. This belief in, in industrial democracy and this one big union kind of running everything. Of course, in Russia, the one big union was the Communist Party. Americans see this happening in Russia and they look at, you, at the growing labor movement here and they make some connections, which although maybe reasonable in some circumstances, uh, Big Bill Haywood in 1918 is tried for murder and he ultimately flees the United States and spends the rest of his life in Moscow. So there are some credible connections there, but the AFL and leading its strikes uh, very much was not a communist organization. The AFL hadn't called for an alternative to industrial capitalism for quite some time now. But these anxieties and fears associated with the Russian Revolution uh, created this, this very anti-labor attitude and sentiment and culture that is, uh, we look back on it now and call the first Red Scare. The first Red Scare sees a lot of the wartime powers that the U.S. government had taken in World War I and sees them directed against the labor movement, right? So it's no longer setting uh, price controls and wage rates, but you do have this, uh, you know, the FBI or the forerunners of the FBI. You have attorney generals like A. Mitchell Palmer doing, doing raids on union halls and uh, socialist meeting circles. Militant groups like the IWW are driven underground. Some of the country's most notable labor organizers are um, kind of uh, deported without any sort of trial or due process back to their own ethnic homelands. And this could be, you know, even if they themselves were never born there, right? Um, Mr. Nico, you know, you've been accused of, of uh, conspiracy. You know, you've been organizing um, a labor union and that's a conspiracy to upset, you know, business and commerce in the United States. You know, you're not in this courtroom. You're, uh, we can't find you. We're conducting this trial in absentia. We're, you know, sentencing you to be deported back to Italy. And when this organizer, this hypothetical Mr. Nico is, is found, they just send him right back to Italy, despite the fact that he was born in the Bronx, right? You have some pretty famous... Um, some pretty famous trials of labor organizers who are found guilty and executed of crimes they likely did not commit. Earlier on, you have uh, Italian anarchists like Sacco and Vanzetti, um, not directly tied to the Red Scare, but kind of in the same vein and sentiment. Later on, further on in the 1920s and 1930s, you have similar trials uh, being these kind of kangaroo showcase trials against groups, uh, labor organizers. In a strategy to kind of outlast this anti-union anti -union panic, the remaining AFL kind of pulls back from organizing efforts. They suffer a series of pretty crushing defeats. Um, in 1919, uh, the AFL and some of it, these more radical unions like the IWW actually uh, cooperate together to launch a general strike in cities like Seattle, that's crushed. And so after the series of defeats and with this uh, kind of rising fear and panic and this red scare associated and kind of directed to the labor movement, the AFL starts to pull back. As America enters the roaring 20s, um, 
the U.S. kind of encounters this period of national prosperity. As it turns out, when you uh, engage in a war to destroy half of the world's industrial productive base is what happens in like Germany and Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire and Russia. France doesn't do too well either after, after World War I. When all of this happens, uh, the US is able to perform pretty well economically. There's not a lot of global competition for its manufacturers or its industries. Something very similar happens after uh, World War II. You see a similar economic boom. This is called the Roaring Twenties. And while not everyone uh, benefits from the Roaring Twenties, the prosperity that takes place in the 1920s is enough to convince a lot of Americans that the labor movement isn't really as, as necessary or uh, as prescient of an issue as it had been uh, during the Progressive Era, right? During the Gilded Age when, when uh, income and disparities were so high. Now in the 1920s, these income disparities are actually going to widen even more. The rich are going to get even richer and the poor are going to get even poorer. But the general uh, atmosphere of prosperity is enough to buoy sentiments to the point where, where calls for militant action are not, as, are not as pronounced, they're not as effective. Again, say for some of these notable clashes like the Battle of Blair Mountain in 1990, or 1921, not 91. In 1921, you have the Battle of Blair Mountain in West Virginia. Situation somewhat similar to, uh, to the Ludlow Massacre and the Colorado Coalfield War takes place in West Virginia. Actually, in uh, the Battle of Blair Mountain, you actually, in the, for the first time that we know of in, in American history, you see a plane being used to drop a bomb on a different, uh, on a different um, actor in a conflict. The bomb was dropped by uh, kind of this forerunner to the Air Force, right? They didn't have the Air Force at this time yet, but they did have people flying in planes in a military capacity. The US government drops bombs on strikers. There's another major strike in 1922 called the Great, called the Great Railroad Strike. It's not the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, but it's a big one. But despite this, there's not going to be a really a resurgence of labor activism in the 1930s until the 1930s when we see kind of the rise of the Great Depression. That isn't to say the labor movement is going to go anywhere, but it's going to, it's going to go to sleep for a little bit. If you're interested, by the way, in the Battle of Blair Mountain, in our uh, lecture materials, there is a brief video about the Battle of Blair Mountain. I would encourage you to watch it, but it is not required. So let's recap. In the Pullman strike, the disunity in the labor movement ended up breaking even an immensely popular strike, right? Disunity in the labor movement can make or break labor actions. That's what Pullman from uh, 1893 and 1894 tells us. In the anthracite coal strike of 1902, you see that public support for workers, uh, their causes, their strikes, their labor actions can be incredibly important. That's especially true when that support can temper some of the most anti-labor government responses. If a government is going, to be claim, is going to claim to be democratic or even going to claim to represent the people, if you're looking at a government that isn't democratic, that's like outside the United States, it needs to at least react somewhat to the demands of its workers, right? So if there is enough public support for a strike or for a labor cause, even the most anti-worker governments usually will have to respond to it. In the Bread and Roses strike, the inclusive organizing approach of the IWW, right, this radical group seeking this, uh, this industrial democracy, their inclusive organizing ability allowed workers who were previously viewed as unorganizable to win gains that weren't believed possible by more kind of respectable and entrenched organizations like the AFL. And when we look at the Colorado Coalfield War and the Ludlow Massacre in 1913 and 1914, a year after Bread and Roses, which was 1912, if you're a person for dates, we're reminded that labor history isn't peaceful. Some of the most monumental gains for the labor movement were won amid periods of horrendous violence. That can be true for the IWW in Lawrence when uh, it took the beating of children at a train station to galvanize the public or it could be at the Ludlow Massacre or the Battle of Blair Mountain, where in order to win the gains that they ultimately do, workers had to very literally fight for them. 
sometimes we have this desire to view our national past as something peaceful and equanimitable and orderly and just. Um, we need to resist those kinds of stereotypes because they're incredibly false and they can lead us to the wrong conclusions about not only labor history, but history in general. Now this is going to be the last lecture before our midterm, so it's worth paying a little bit of extra attention to our vocabulary. The one big union is this aspirational organization that would, you know, depending on who you ask, represent the international working class um, economically, politically, and socially to varying degrees of power, right? Is it going to be like a more inclusive labor federation that's going to subsume the AFL? Or is it going to replace government and capitalism entirely? The IWW will tell you one thing, the United Mine Workers will tell you another. Both of those groups, however, adopt an approach called industrial unionism, which is organizing labor, organizing workers, all in the same industry into one organization. This is regardless of their skill or trade. If you can unite all workers in one industry, regardless of skill, then by sheer numbers alone, as well as by the benefit of having all of the skilled trades workers in your union, you're more able to effectively challenge employers and industries when you're bargaining for greater rights. Company towns are towns where nearly all stores, housing, and other amenities are controlled by one core company, which is also that town's main employer. A lot of times we look at company towns as this thing, this antiquated thing out west that we don't have to deal with anymore. In the 1930s, we had company towns here. You have Dearborn and Highland Park and Hamtramck and Pontiac and Flint, which are pretty key to the American auto industry. You could even uh, look at some kind of sundown towns today, towns that are kind of rural and more organized around one, out, one industry. You could make the case for some uh, areas in the metropolitan Detroit area today being viewed as, as company towns, depending on your how you specifically define them. A sympathy strike is a strike where workers engage in a labor action or a stoppage or a slowdown, not because they have a direct in grievance with their own employer, but because they want to offer support for another group of workers on strike, usually in some kind of related industry or enterprise. Sympathy strikes today are no longer legal. In 1947, they were outlawed, outlawed by the Taft-Hartley Slave Labor Act. We'll get back to that in, uh, after our midterm. An industrial democracy is a system where processes of economic decision-making are at least partially controlled or influenced by unions and other working class organizations. So again, for the IWW, industrial democracy would be the one big union. For the United Mine Workers or for more militant uh, workers in the AFL, industrial democracy might just look like uh, inclusion of the labor movement at a federal level. Depends on who you ask sometimes for these things. All right, so again, um, our midterm is going to be next week. Midterm exam will be listed as an assignment available on Canvas starting at 12.01 a.m. on Monday, October 26th. It will be available until 11.59 p.m. on Sunday, November 1st, and then November 2nd, we'll be coming back uh, for our follow-up lecture on industrial unionism and the Great Depression. There's gonna be three portions on the exam. Uh, the first is a 25 multiple choice questions. That's going to be on Canvas as a quiz assignment. Um, they're going to pull pretty heavily from past lecture quizzes, so make, it's worth uh, kind of reviewing those and making sure you know the answers to those if you want to make sure you get a good, get a good grade on, on the midterm exam. There's also a second and third part. Uh, once you complete the 25 multiple choice questions, they're at four points apiece, so 100 points, that's half of the, that's half of the midterm exam. Do not forget to do the other half. The other half, uh, of the midterm exam um, comprises of 10 term identification questions worth five points each. You'll be given a list of 20 total vocabulary terms, right? So terms like company town, sympathy strike, industrial democracy, et cetera, et cetera. You'll have 20 of those. Uh, and out of those 20, you have to pick 10 and you have to identify them, right? Tell me what the definition is and why they're significant. And then there will be one essay question. 
Um, I don't want anyone to worry too much about the essay question. Uh, there is a word count limit of 500 words, so I'm not asking that you, you know, write a very long, drawn, thought out response. Um, you do want to give it some consideration and kind of fine tune your essay uh, before you submit it. But it's not going to be this very long drawn out paper. It's kind of more of a short answer uh, prompt that you have to respond to. There is no specific time limit for the midterm exam um, outside of the one week period you have, right? So if you open up the multiple choice uh, portion of the exam Monday morning and you answer 22 of the questions, but you leave three because you want to go and check your notes or your books, it is open note and open book, obviously. So feel free to use those resources. Feel free to use the, the Canvas OneNote page while you're working through this. But if you get to those last three, you know, it's not like you have till the end of the day to finish that portion. Just as long as uh, everything is in before midnight, the night of Sunday, November 1st, going to November 2nd will be fine. Don't, uh, if I'm going to give you any more added advice, don't wait to do the, the term identification or essay questions until the end. At the very least, open up the file, see what the expectation is there. And so you're making sure you're giving yourself uh, enough leeway to, uh, to do those portions uh, as well as you want to do them, right? That is going to be the end of our lecture today. I'm looking forward to speaking with you all um, on the 19th for our final discussion class. We'll go over the midterm exam a little bit more there as well. Um, and uh, I'll make sure that the midterm exam study guide is posted to Canvas when this lecture goes live. So look for that also. Um, otherwise, uh, make sure to uh, go ahead and ask if you have any sort of questions regarding the content of today's lecture. I'm always willing to answer any questions you do have. Uh, until later, uh, in solidarity, see you later.